Red Ray Gun Limited presents The Benji and Nick Show Hello and as we mentioned in the last Benji and Nick Show no discussion of cult TV here but there is however this special audiobook presentation for you um, it's called Alien England and have a listen see what you think <laughs> Oh, by the way, if you want to let us know what you think, do email us at podcast at nicholasbriggs.com. Benji and I will, of course, be back next week, and we'll be talking about New Scotland Yard. Alien England by Nicholas Briggs. Day one. Interior National Coalition Party HQ, London, 0703 hours. Several news channels on a bank of screens. Sound turned down low. A flutter of colours and earnest journalistic mutterings. The sense of anticipation in the room. Around 50 party workers, up all night. None had dared to touch a drop of alcohol, strict party rules. Be sober. Be responsible. A government in waiting. And the waiting was nearly over. The booze was locked away, but everyone knew where it was. Shirt sleeves, loosened ties, untucked blouses, some kicked off high heels, the smell of stale perfume, deodorant, sweat, unseasonably warm weather, an army of discarded jackets and coats hanging off the backs of chairs. The party workers were wearily pawing their mobile devices and laptops. Figures coming in, live updates, exit polls, tantalising indications. The frenzy of a deeply bitter British general election had finally fizzled into this hoarse, pained exhaustion of waiting. Too close to call. All the journalists were muttering it from the screens like the growing buzz of a secret chant. But Scott Hamilton looked like a man who knew something more than everyone else. He had arrived, quietly slinking in, leaning on the doorframe, affecting casual interest after a one-hour power nap. A few party workers noticed him and instinctively started to rise. The infection of his charisma evoked in them warm twinges of favourite schoolmasters, good fathers, trusty bank managers, idealised and reassuringly tangible. Scott calmly waved them back down into their plastic chairs, the naturally upturned sides of his mouth creasing asymmetrically as he provided his trademark intoxicating wink. Exterior, just off the Dorset coast, 0705 hours. Swerving and banking, the stuttering sound of some kind of jet propulsion cutting in and out. A reflective object about the size and shape of a military fighter aircraft tumbled out of control. It hit the water in a blur of speed, a cascade of spray and a tidal surge washing over the entirety of the east beach of West Bay, surging through seaside cottages, a restaurant, a pub and a car park. Four early morning dog walkers and their dogs were instantly killed by a combination of impact trauma and drowning. Some 23 others were badly injured. The shattering sound of the crash had followed a split second after the impact and was heard for miles around. The local police immediately dispatched a squad car to the coast. Emergency phone calls flooded in. A terrorist attack was suspected. The security forces of the UK were alerted. The corridors of secret operations buzzed with anticipation, deep within Whitehall and deep within establishments forever hidden from public cognizance. Exterior 
National Coalition Party HQ, 0732 hours. Scott Hamilton wasn't waiting for the trip to Buckingham Palace to ask the King for permission to form the next government, although, of course, he would observe that formality. He wasn't waiting to make a speech outside Number 10 Downing Street either. That, too, would come later. His political instinct told him he must grab the initiative now. He strode from his party headquarters to stand at a hastily prepared podium, festooned with microphones. A gathering of journalists surged towards him, cameras flashing, a flurry of questions bristling. They knew. He knew. The confidence of his face said it all. He waved his hands soothingly, gave that signature wink and smile, and for a moment... One of those extraordinary things happened. To Scott, it felt like the mantle of greatness descending upon him. In truth, it may have just been the result of mass weariness, of political fatigue, that sense that, one way or another, all the arguments and anger were over, at least for a few hours. It may have been just an exhalation. But what it looked like, what it could easily be mistaken for, was that moment of greatness. Because the journalists all stopped speaking. With a gesture, Scott Hamilton had calmed the raging sea before him. And this chance, coincidence of his moving hands, of his audience's exhaustion, and of this particular moment in British political history, this fluke occurrence fostered within Scott the illusion of destiny. The hairs on the back of his neck tingled. He felt a warmth within. This was, he suddenly felt sure, the best moment of his life. And somehow that feeling radiated out from him and genuinely did affect those standing before him. That extraordinary, almost indefinable effect that humans can have upon each other when one of them exerts power in precisely the right way at precisely the right moment. And, even in spite of themselves, those around that person are, what, caught up in it all? Intoxicated, even. Whatever the real reason, the silence continued uncannily for a few seconds, but Scott could wait no longer to gorge himself upon statesmanlike glory. I think it's clear, he began with a knowing smile. He let that hang in the air, arresting his charismatic smile with a modest shrug. A rumble of laughter rolled through the crowd. He continued, giving that time-to-be-serious-now folks nod. All the indications are that our National Coalition Party has secured enough votes and members of Parliament for us to form the next government of the United Kingdom. There were cheers from the party faithful behind him. Some journalists smiled. There was even a smattering of applause from within their ranks. Others looked glum and even sick. The effect of the charisma had gone utterly cold for them. A voice from the crowd could wait no longer. Which policy are you going to deliver on first, Mr Hamilton? Scott squinted through the flash photography for a moment to identify the speaker. As he thought from the tone, a hostile questioner from the BBC. Will it be controlling the food riots in the north or your immigrant identification scheme? Continued the questioner. Scott drew breath to answer. But he stopped as he caught sight of Alice Asheville heading towards him through the crowd of party workers. She was his chief political adviser. In short, the reason he was about to become Prime Minister of the UK. The expression on her face told him not to say anything. He trusted her implicitly. And although he couldn't think of any reason why he shouldn't immediately proclaim the imminent implementation of his flagship policies... Do you have any reaction to the developing emergency in Dorset? Another voice rang out. Alice was having trouble getting through the crowd. Scott shot her a look. 
She was pushing hard to get past a particularly enthusiastic knot of party workers. They resisted her until they could see it was her. Finally, the crowds started to part. He hasn't heard, muttered a journalist close by. Alice was suddenly at Scott's side. He bent his head down, expecting an urgent whisper in his ear. But instead, she firmly reached round to his left shoulder and turned him away from the microphones, propelling him towards a cluster of advisers behind him. He spotted a government limousine pulling up in a side street just beyond party headquarters. He knew it was for him. He headed towards it, just catching Alice's words to the crowd behind him. The Prime Minister is about to receive a full briefing on that emergency situation, she was saying. He isn't the Prime Minister yet, called out a journalist. Somewhat savagely, Alice countered. Oh, I think you're just splitting hairs now, Joe. Exterior, West Bay, East Beach, Dorset, 10.07 hours. Emma Wells had been woken at 07.17 hours by a FaceTime call from someone she'd never met. But he clearly had access to all kinds of advanced security software because his call had somehow managed to switch on all the devices in her flat and set off her burglar alarm. He clearly had been very keen to wake her up. She knew that she'd ticked a box somewhere on her application form for her current job, research leader in interplanetary sciences at Wharton University, expressing a willingness to make herself available for government service in time of crisis. At that point, she'd rather fancied the idea, having a fantasy about various science fiction films over the years when lowly scientists had been plucked from obscurity to save the day. Now she had actually received the call, she just felt a bit sick and quite scared. The feeling sick may have been caused by the third of a bottle of red wine she'd consumed the night before. She wasn't good with alcohol, but had felt it was the only escape from her worries about the unpleasant interdepartmental squabbling at her university. The man on the FaceTime call had given her the code name of the operation she was to advise upon, Viper, and had told her that a car was waiting outside. She should get dressed quickly and bring nothing else with her, expressly not any mobile devices or phones. The car had, oddly, taken her to a local park in southeast London. She hadn't seen any sign of Operation Viper here. She had been confused, but the dark-suited security guard and driver with her had been unforthcoming. Moments later, a helicopter had landed. She had been whisked aboard and was now stepping out of said helicopter in West Bay on the Dorset coast. She could see that the beach had been cordoned off and that there were military personnel and vehicles in evidence. During the helicopter journey, she'd been given a file to read on a tablet. It had been a live file constantly updated from the crash site. Crash site. That was worrying. An aircraft had apparently crashed early this morning just off West Bay, a modestly popular coastal destination. There had been fatalities, serious injuries and significant damage to property. Divers were investigating the wreck. Despite the deafening whir of the helicopter, the swirling wind, the toing and froing of military personnel, the fact that no one would really talk to her and the sickness in her stomach, so far... Emma was pretty much making sense of all this. Only one question was bothering her. What's all this got to do with me? She asked the most important looking military person she'd seen so far this morning. He shook her hand, said hello, introduced himself. She instantly forgot his name. And instead of answering her question, he gestured to an approaching frogman who was running up the beach towards them, removing his mask and flippers. He was furiously pointing to the tablet in Emma's hands. She looked down at it and could see that video was streaming. It was a live feed, as the advancing timestamp correlated to the time at the top of the device's screen. At that moment, the helicopter lifted off. Relaxing a little in the sudden quietness, Emma squinted at the screen and asked, 
Is this the aircraft? She looked up at the frogman, who she discovered was a woman. The army officer angled himself around to look at the screen. And then a thought struck Emma. She could tell from the diver's expression that she was already thinking it. And it was dawning on the officer's face, too. The streaming image showed the fuselage of something that did indeed look like some sort of jet aircraft underwater. But the problem was, if it had crashed, why wasn't it damaged in any way? Exterior, 10 Downing Street, Central London, 1100 hours. After a short briefing from the security services concerning the West Bay crash, Scott Hamilton had been rushed to Buckingham Palace. He'd had a short, formal meeting with the King, who, in a carefully prepared question, had asked Scott to form the next government. Scott had accepted graciously, oozing as much charm as he could muster. His smile had not been returned by His Majesty. Instead, Scott felt he detected distinct disapproval. Luckily for Scott, it didn't matter what the views of the King were. Scott had simply bowed politely and respectfully, and had headed for the door. "'I trust your intention is to unite this nation,' the King had said, as a kind of headmasterly parting shot. "'Very much so, sir,' Scott had said. He had detected some scepticism on His Majesty's face, as the King had nodded slightly, as they were receiving news of only the mildest interest. Now Scott was getting out of a limousine outside of his new official residence, Number 10 Downing Street, the home of the Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. His home. He was Prime Minister. His trusty political adviser, Alice Ashville, greeted him ostensibly to guide him to the podium outside number 10, actually to issue a quick warning under her breath. It's all about the Dorset situation, she said. They're going to try to trip you up on your competence in a crisis. First big test. Don't give the bastards an inch. Keep it short. You're busy. No time for policy statements. They know all that. Scott was a trifle wounded. No time at all, he asked. He'd prepared a speech. Alice shot him a steely glare. Trust me, this is a defining moment. Screw it up and you'll spend the next four years apologising for it. Scott wasn't keen on apologising to anyone for anything. It was a well-aimed warning from Alice. So, as he got to the podium, he obeyed her instructions to the letter. I know it's customary to speak to the nation at this moment of our plans for the future. But we all know there's an emergency unfolding and it would be a dereliction of my duty as Prime Minister not to attend to matters of national security first. Thank you for your understanding. And with that, he'd done it again. Reduced the press to silence. Twice in one day. He was becoming a legend before lunchtime. Interior, Cabinet Room, 10 Downing Street, Central London, 11.05 hours. Incoming Prime Minister Scott Hamilton was introduced to the members of the emergency security briefing team known as COBRA. Unlike Emma in West Bay, he was well versed in remembering the names of those he was introduced to. He logged each and every name. He nodded to a select group from his former shadow cabinet, who were also sitting around the table. General Sir Alan Goodridge, coordinating the security operation, handed Scott a tablet. Scott glanced down and could see the nervous face of a woman in her thirties on the screen, presumably awaiting his response. "'We can pipe it onto the big screen if you wish, Prime Minister,' said Goodridge. Scott could already see Alice nodding very definitely. "'Do that,' said Scott. Everyone in the room turned to the large screen on the wall. Alice nudged close to Scott. She murmured, Emma Wells, expert in interplanetary sciences, she didn't vote for you. Interplanetary, Scott murmured back. Then, without taking a breath, Emma, he said to the screen with a firm smile. Tell us what we're dealing with, would you please? I'm, 
I'm not sure, said Emma. There was a rumble of dissatisfaction from around the room. Scott thought he saw General Goodridge roll his eyes. Scott didn't flinch. Can you tell us what we're not dealing with? he asked. On the screen, Emma took a breath. Scott could see her confidence growing a little. He'd asked the right question. Well, she started considering for a moment. We're not dealing with any recognisable aircraft. The design is suggestive of a jet fighter, but... She petered out. Not any known design? asked Scott. Something new? Foreign? Goodridge and his team leant forward, concerned. It's difficult to explain, said Emma. OK, Emma, said Scott with studied patience. Just tell us what you think. Exterior, West Bay, Dorset Coast, 11.07 hours. Emma looked at this new Prime Minister staring up at her from the tablet she was holding. She'd never liked the look of him, and she didn't like the policies of his alliance of centre-right and far-right parties. She'd voted for the other lot, the centre-left coalition, who'd had such a disastrous time ever since Brexit. Now there were riots on the streets, a UK recession and border tensions and the centre-left had lost a vote of no confidence only two years after scraping into power with a tiny majority. Emma knew that something momentous was potentially happening here on the beach at West Bay, and Scott Hamilton was just about the last person on earth she wanted to tell about it. But in this nightmare scenario, he was now the Prime Minister. All the jokes about his smart three-piece suits and his sick-making wink were horribly outdated all of a sudden. He was now running the country, and at this very moment, she had to behave as though he was in charge of her, personally. And, worst of all, she was about to say something which would probably sound very, very stupid. If you could imagine, she began, then stopped. She saw the Prime Minister make a pained expression. He was probably losing patience with her, she thought. If you were a very talented artist, she continued, not an engineer, not anyone who actually built jet fighters, and you had seen, say, pictures of lots of different jet fighters, she said. This wasn't going well. Prime Minister Scott Hamilton was starting to look more than a little sceptical. Okay, he said. I'm not really following this. I don't think any of us are. Is there someone else there we can speak to, Emma? Someone who... Look, just bear with me, will you? I know you're not very fond of listening to people, but I'm trying to tell you something here, she blurted out, then added awkwardly. Uh, Prime Minister. All right, okay, just tell us something, Emma, said the Prime Minister, the warning tone in his voice definitely evident. Well, imagine you'd seen a lot of pictures of jet fighters but didn't really know anything about them, but then you were asked to draw a really authentic-looking one from memory. Can you imagine that? asked Emma. OK, right, I think we're all imagining that now, said the Prime Minister in a sort of what-the-hell-are-you-going-on-about way. And then imagine that someone built a craft based on your drawing, said Emma. I mean, actually went and built it, even though it didn't really make any sense. Are you saying that's what we've got there in West Bay? asked the Prime Minister. Pretty much, said Emma. The Prime Minister said, I don't think any of us here knows what that means. It means it looks like a plane, but it isn't one, said Emma. Then what is it? asked the Prime Minister. Possibly the reason they brought me here, said Emma. She was suddenly aware of the noise of a crane working behind her. She looked round. Something was being lifted out of the water. Listen, I have to go now. They're pulling it out of the water, she said to the Prime Minister. She clocked his irked expression as she handed the tablet hurriedly to the military man whose name she couldn't remember. She dashed down the beach 
only to be confronted by three soldiers brandishing their rifles. They waved her down, as though instructing a speeding vehicle to pull over. Impatiently, she waited with them, looking out to sea a few yards. As the crane seemed to step up a gear in its efforts, it pulled a gleaming fuselage out of the sea, streaming water. It seemed to take hours, but Emma's intense curiosity and impatience was dilating the time. Eventually, the crane set it down on the shingle of the beach. The officer waved for the soldiers to allow Emma forward. She ran straight to the craft and immediately put her hands on its gleaming, reflective surface. She washed the water off its surface as she ran her hands along, approaching the cockpit. And there, through the window, she could see the dead pilot. He wore an oxygen mask and goggles. His skin was puffy and white. He must have died on impact. But how? There was no sign of injury and the fuselage was completely undamaged. The officer was now by Emma's side. He passed her the tablet. She indicated she didn't want it. Not that bloody Prime Minister again. He could wait. Clearly sensing that was her reason, the officer shook his head and brandished the tablet closer to her. She reluctantly glanced at it. Thankfully, it didn't display Scott Hamilton's annoying face at all. It's the radar report on the craft's trajectory, said the officer. Oh, thanks. Sorry, said Emma as she studied it. Then she looked up at the officer. Sorry, I'm really sorry, but I've forgotten your name. Colonel Headley, Special Security Group, he said with a slight smile. But you can call me Dan if you like. Emma, she said. I know, he smiled back. This radar track, it shows that it came in from orbit, she said. That's what we thought. That's why you're here, said Dan. Yeah, said Emma, suddenly feeling as though she was in a bit of a daze. She focused on the dead pilot. Then who the hell is this? she asked. It was at that moment that the pilot suddenly gasped, spluttered, and pulled the goggles off his face. His fists suddenly thudded against the sides of the cockpit. There you have it, Alien England. And um, as I mentioned at the beginning, Benji and I will be back next week discussing New Scotland Yard, among many other things. Pressing stop now. ka -ching.